Philippians 4, 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Brother Steve. Come let us worship and bow down. Let concerning prayer, prayer to God. Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love and those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant and your servants here today praying before you. Let us pray. Father God, we have gathered here again in your presence. You are our God. You are our sustainer. You made everything here on earth by the command of your hand. And you said everything was good, and it has been good, Father. And we're so thankful for the, the beautiful world that you created in which we now live. We appreciate and, and praise you for your faithfulness in our lives, Father. We come to you and cast all our cares on you because you care for us. You have created us in abundance. We pray, Father, as we worship here today and as we leave this place, that you will help us remove all evil thoughts and all evil things from our lives. Let us be renewed, Father, by your presence with us here today. Give us the strength to face the adversities in our lives that we face each and every day. And Father, let everything that we do in this service this morning glorify your name. We worship you because you are our God, not just for now, but you are our God forever. And Father, we, we heard the names of many individuals that have asked for prayer this morning. And we just ask that you, you meet the needs of those individuals. We're mindful, especially of the Spears family, whose memorial service was conducted here yesterday. Please continue to be with them, Father. Comfort them in the difficult days that, that follow. Bless our church, Father. As we continue to recover from the effects of, of COVID, encourage those who have been absent from the assembly to return as soon as they're comfortable in doing so. Let them know, Father, that they are being missed. And Father, we ask that you bless them where they are in, in their place of worship this morning. And lastly, Father, we ask that you bless our nation. Father, help our nation mend 
the differences that have divided us so in so many different ways in so many different directions bring us back together father as one nation guide the leader of our nation with your love and with your assurances and help them find a way to help this nation continue to grow and bless it in all the things that, that, that occur. For we ask these all these things in the name of the one that you sent to this earth to be example for each and every one of us to show how much you love us and how much we should love each other. So we ask these things in his name. And amen. Stand with me and let's sing some songs leading up to the taking of the Lord's Supper together. There is beyond the azure blue. Sing out a song, I sing out a song to Jesus. 
Tell me the story of Jesus Cry on my heart every word Tell me the story most precious Sweetest ever was heard Tell how the angels in chorus As we continue our time in worship this morning, I'd like to read these words before we take communion. A widow mother sacrificed in many ways, such as taking in washing so that she could send her boy to college. Finally, the day of graduation came, and she went to see him receive his diploma. As, she, as he looked out over the audience, he was unwilling to claim his mother because of the shabby dress she wore. She didn't fit in with the beautiful clothing worn by parents of his friends. When the graduation was over, he didn't seek her out and proudly introduce her to his friends, but rather he slipped quietly away to celebrate with his classmates. Tom Mooney was involved in dynamiting back in 1916. When several people were killed, the evidence pointed so directly toward him that after a time, he was arrested, convicted, and sent to the state penitentiary. His wife began what proved to be a 30-year-long effort to try to free her husband from prison. During those years, she worked to support herself. At times, she could find no employment other than that of a scrub woman. Constantly, she was seeing everybody of importance, everybody that might try to influence, trying desperately somehow to achieve her husband's release from prison. And finally, after 30 long years, she stirred up enough feeling that he was allowed to go free. Within a year, he had left her, found another woman, and married her. These are stories of unrequited love, love that hasn't been returned. Perhaps the harshest of all pain is caused by love that is desired but never returned. The largest percentage of the world give Jesus unrequited love. No love in return for his great love and sacrifice that he made for us. Many times we somehow feel that we deserve all that he has done for us or that his sacrifice wasn't so big after all. Mel Gibson did a great job of illustrating how much pain Jesus went through in his movie, The Passion of Christ. But unrequited love, the worst of all pain, cannot be shown. It can only be felt in the heart. Would you bow with me? Father, this morning as we gather around your table, Father, we just pray that you help us to examine our hearts. We do not want to be people who do not reflect your love and to give our love wholeheartedly to you. Help us always appreciate the great sacrifice that you made through giving your one and only Son that through his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension to you on high, 
we pray, Father, that now as we partake of this bread, we do so in a pleasing manner to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you bow with me again? Heavenly Father, as we together take this cup in memory of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross, let us examine our hearts that we might do so in a manner pleasing to you. And that through this, Father, you will strengthen the bond between us and between you and us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. church. If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to turn to John chapter 8. It's been a strange morning. Putting on a pair of socks and they tore. I mean just the things just like exploded on me. Never had that happen, a pair of socks that just sort of disintegrated while I was putting them on. And so uh, 
And so, yeah, I had to go get new socks. Uh, but then, uh, and then, you know, I was trying to stand up a minute ago, Steve, while everybody else was sitting down. I guess, I don't know. Spirit moved me to stand right there, but I was the only one. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it is good to be here. Good to see you all. I know we have uh, folks that are gone and uh, it's, it's vacation season. I see a lot of faces that have just been to the beach and glad to have you all back. But uh, looking forward to our time together in God's Word this morning and invite you to bow with me for a word of prayer. Holy Father, we just come before you now asking your blessing on this time in your word. Father, that you would allow your spirit to prepare our hearts and clear our minds of the distractions of this world. And Father, that you would just be able to help me get across this message that's been laid on my heart this week. Father, I just ask that this message as always be yours and yours alone. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, it was a strange phenomenon that was discovered in World War I. Fighter pilots in open cockpit aircraft discovered that low velocity shrapnel was better defended with something that was soft and luxurious. It was silk. So they would take layers of silk. Scientists couldn't even explain why, but layers of silk seemed to be better at protecting them from the shrapnel fired at them from the ground than steel would be. And so they would take layers of silk and wrap it around their necks and layers of silk and wrap it around their heads underneath those leather helmets that they wore. And so it seems odd, doesn't it, that something so soft would be the better defender against something that is potentially going to harm you. And as we look at our series on becoming more like Jesus, Jesus showed us the same holds true for human character. That some people try to be impenetrable to those around them. But Jesus showed us that gentleness and a heart that is soft toward others and tenderness are actually qualities of strength. In Philippians 4 5, the verse that Daryl read uh, earlier this morning, the word that is translated as gentleness is epiikes, the Greek word epiikes. And some synonyms for that word are fair and reasonable and moderate, in addition to being translated as, as gentleness. Fair, reasonable, and moderate. But in Galatians 5.22, where we derive gentleness as part of Paul's list of fruits of the Spirit... We get a different word. It's preutes. And preutes, its synonyms for gentleness are mildness and humility. Now, one author uh, even says that you know, it could be described as mild medication. He says as if something that would, would calm uh, a, a nauseated stomach. And so you think about the opposite of gentleness, maybe arrogance or pride. And you think about, the author said, you know, there's some people in the world that because of their attitudes, you know, maybe someone that is overly arrogant, prideful, that they kind of turn your stomach a little bit. And so if we're going to be people who bear this fruit of gentleness... It could be said that we are people who are not nauseating. So I could say, hey, church, the main takeaway this morning is don't be nauseating to other people. All right, let's stand and sing. No, not going to let you off that, that easy this morning. Sorry. But yeah, the, the idea that, that a gentle person is one that is like, is like medicine. 
you think about it in those terms. Those people that you see coming and you think to yourself, oh my goodness, I just love them. You know, uh, she is always in a good mood. She's always got a smile on her face or he has always got something kind to say. At the service here on uh, on Friday, I, I saw someone that I in the community that I don't get to see very often. And, and it, it, I thought later about that person. They've always got a smile on their face. I have never seen that person when they're not smiling. Now, what a testament it is to that person and their attitude, their outlook on life, their demeanor. As my dad used to say back in the day, their disposition. That, you know, that they, every time I see them... <laughs> morning, noon, or night, that they have got a smile on their face. And so the idea of gentleness is to be that person who is like that salve that just makes everything a little bit better. Now, as we move forward this morning, uh, James 1 verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because church, that's gentleness right there. Gentleness is the opposite of anger. Gentleness is someone who is mild, is someone who is calm, is someone who takes in the situation. Now, how much more, how much better, let me put it that way, would our world be if we practice James 1, 19 more often and on a regular basis? And yes, I'm, I'm speaking to, my, to myself right now. I'm preaching to myself this morning, church. That if we could be people who are quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, what would our interactions with one another look like? What would social media look like if everyone, before they posted or before they commented, was slow to speak and slow to become angry. What would January 6th that our nation's capital have looked like if everyone was much slower to speak and slower to become angry? I could argue that those three capital police officers would likely not have lost their lives that day if more people were slow to speak and slow to become angry. Gentleness is not being enraged. Gentleness is seeking to understand. Gentleness is practicing a calm demeanor because when one person is calm, it can take someone else who's on edge and it can help de-escalate the situation. Now we think about gentleness. Jesus shows us in John chapter 8 a situation where he was gentle in the face of something. Jesus has been with people and uh, it says at the end of John 7 that they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And so we don't know that he stayed there all night. But the next thing we know, it says at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts. Now, I have no way of knowing how long Jesus stayed at the Mount of Olives. But we know it's repeatedly mentioned in the Gospels that Jesus went to a solitary place and prayed. And so Jesus, after spending some time in prayer, he goes out in public again. He's in the temple courts. And when you're in the temple courts, teaching as he was, he never knew what people were going to throw at him. 
You know, I used to say that, that the most interesting hour of my week was Wednesday night from 7 to 8 p.m. Because that hour of the evening, I don't know, people just have more to say than they do in a Bible class on a Sunday morning. And so that hour of the week, I never knew what some people were going to bring up. I still don't. But I enjoy it. I enjoy it. Sometimes I don't have answers to everyone's questions. I'm human. I don't have all the answers. It's a thick book, as I like to say. But... Jesus was the same way. He never knew what people were going to throw at him. And so he is there teaching in the temple courts. All the people gathered around him, verse 2, and he sat down to teach them. The, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Now, of course, we know that when the Pharisees are asking Jesus a question, they're not seeking to understand, are they, church? No. When the Pharisees are asking Jesus a question, it's for one reason. Entrapment. That is their modus operandi, you might say. That is their agenda. And so they're thinking, okay, how are we going to catch him this time? At some point, we're going to trip this dude up. We don't know where he got his education, but he didn't sit at the feet of our rabbis. And so Jesus, minding his own business, teaching in the temple courts, and they, they here come the Pharisees stirring up trouble. Hey, this woman caught in adultery. And of course, they embarrass her. It says that they, they made her stand before the group. And so... Uh, now, what do you say? Verse 6, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Now, what he ultimately said was, hey, those of you that are perfect, sling away. Those of you that have never done anything wrong, because sin is sin. You may not be guilty of this particular sin, but you're guilty of something. And in the eyes of our Father, it's just as bad. So, those of you that are perfect, absolutely perfect, you go ahead and you be the one to throw that first stone. I think it's interesting that John tells us specifically that it is the older ones who left first. That certain amount of inherent wisdom that comes with age. And so them realizing, well, there's no way I can throw this stone. And I can just see them one by one dropping those stones and slowly walking away. Now, at no point does Jesus say, hey, what you've done is okay. 
Jesus isn't saying, hey, there's no consequences to sin. That's not the point of this at all, is it, church? At no point does he say, hey, no big deal that you were caught in adultery. What he says to her is leave your life of sin. What I read into that is, hey, learn from this. Don't make this mistake anymore. What he's still saying to us today is, what's done is done. But don't live a life where you are steeped in sin. Don't live a life where you're repeating the same sins over and over. Don't live a life where you find yourself in a place where you like certain sins. And so we know that there's consequences to our sin. Jesus doesn't have to explain to her, hey, when you get home, there's going to be a difficult conversation because you've been outed in public this morning. He doesn't say to her, you know, it's this kind of behavior that tears families apart, that breaks hearts. He doesn't have to. We all know that. We all know there's consequences to sin. But Jesus, church, in his gentleness, doesn't come out and say, Girl, what were you thinking? What, 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 what led you down this path? Didn't your parents teach you any better than that? I mean, you know, haven't you, haven't you heard parts of the Torah read? Don't you know the commandments? He doesn't thou shalt her, does he? No. In his gentleness, he de-escalates the situation and says, Okay, if you're perfect, you can condemn her. And they don't. And he simply says, I don't condemn you either. But stop doing what you've been doing. Now, this is my dog, Arlo. And Arlo does not eat people food, pretty much. I mean, he eats dog food because he's a dog. But Arlo does like to eat, you know, that little last morsel of the people food. And so the thing about Arlo is... Arlo is not always the most reasonable an animal or creature on the planet. Um, Arlo wants to attack the mailman. Of course, there's a door between him and the mailman. But every morning when the mailman brings the mail, and of course it's not just mail because the post office now delivers a lot of packages. And so the, the mailman is bringing us good stuff that we've ordered, that my wife has ordered. And Arlo, you would think that somebody is trying to get in the house and harm us. That They're trying to tear the door down down by the way this half German shepherd, half who knows what, uh, decides that he is just going to alert the entire house and frankly the entire neighborhood that the mailman is here. He knows the sound of his truck. He knows the sound of his vehicle. He can pull up right in front of the house and Arlo is on the other end of the house and he hears that vehicle and he will go running before he ever has a chance to get out of his vehicle. There is nothing reasonable about Arlo's behavior. And then when you would finish that sandwich or that last bite of something and he would be patiently waiting on you to share that little bit with him, then we learned early on with Arlo, if you have it in your fingers and you, and you hold it out, Arlo had a little problem with depth perception, okay? You, you might lose a valuable digit before you could draw it back. So we learned you either had to put it in his bowl or the, the old toss method. Here you go. I'm going to toss that to you. Now, Arlo is really good at catching stuff. So 
Stacy at some point decided, hey, I can teach this dog something. So she started saying, gentle, gentle. And then she taught Arlo how to be gentle. And so, I mean, it was to the point, it was so bad that Arlo knew you didn't want to hold something out like that. If you held it out like that, had a momentary lapse of reason and held it out, he would actually pull his head back and look at you with wide eyes like, dude, you do not want to do that. <laughs> so Stacy then, working with him, saying gentle, gentle, got it to where Arlo now can just ease in and take that little bit of food from your hands and nobody gets hurt nobody has to go to rapid care or anything like that no stitches no sutures no staples none of that stuff all because she took the time and worked with this creature this incredibly unreasonable creature saying gentle gentle now, church family, if we go back in the book of Genesis, what is God's crowning achievement in creation? The only creatures that he chose to make in his image. The human creature, right? People. We are the crowning achievement of God's creation. We have the ability to reason the way a dog cannot. And if an incredibly unreasonable animal like Arlo can learn, learn gentleness, what's our excuse? With our ability to reason and to think, what keeps us from being more gentle? What keeps us from being slow to speak and slow to become angry? Church, if we're going to bear good fruit, we're going to be people that are easy on the stomach. We're going to be people that are not nauseating. We're going to be people who understand and who learn. And yes, the fruit of the Spirit, it's learned. Little, if any of this, is part of our human nature. That's why Paul gives us a list. If you look prior to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, Paul gives us another list. He says, this is, you know, left to your own devices, left to the flesh, this is who you are. And it's not good stuff. It's not flattering. But then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. I left out faithfulness. And then next week, we conclude with self-control. But church, if my dog can learn gentleness, <laughs> you and I have no excuse, do we? Jesus in Matthew 11, 29 and 30 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Let's be people who understand the gentleness of our Savior. Let's be people who show the world what gentleness looks like. If you're with us today and you have not yet put on Christ in baptism, we offer the invitation not because it's a habit, not because there's something in God's Word that says we have to every time we gather on Sunday mornings. We offer it because there just might be someone here who is ready to make the decision to give their life to Christ. 
and to be immersed in the waters of baptism after confessing that He is Lord, that He is the Son of the one true God. But we also offer the invitation in case there's someone here who needs prayers. If there's someone here who is hurting. If there's someone here who says, I've messed up and I just want this church to be praying for me as I try to move on and move past this. That's why we offer the invitation. Let's stand and sing. Shout to the Lord all-